I get loads of tutorial requests about making realistic interiors in Blender, so this is going to be my ultimate guide to making just about any interior scene with all the little tips and tricks that I use to get realistic results quickly. Instead of designing a room myself from scratch, I'm going to recreate this four door because it has just about everything you might encounter. Plants, rugs, cushions, beds, furniture, loads of other stuff too. By the end of this video, you'll be able to tackle just about any interior scene in Blender. If you're making an interior without a four door reference, you can skip this first step. If you are using a four door, you're going to have to match the perspective. To do that, I like to use this free tool called FSpy. The green markers represent the Y axis, so I'm going to align those with features that are pointing away from the camera. Then I do the same on the X axis and the Z going up and down. The last one's important if you want to get the focal length right. It's also important that we have the right scale for the scene, so if we drag this little blue line in the middle, we can tell FSpy what size that should be. I know that a door is about 2.1 meters tall, so I'm going to align the marker to be about the top and bottom of the door and I'm going to set to 2.1 meters. Finally, I'm just quickly checking the perspectives right by lining up this box with different parts of the photo. There's a handy little add-on that automatically imports FSpy save files into Blender. If you open up your file you'll have the camera in the scene already and the focal length will be set up. So I'm going to align the plane with the floor and then I'm going to extrude out some walls just going to add a few loop cuts here and I'm going to slide them around the walls by double tap and G. That allows us to cut out some features like the door and the window. Once the room's finished, make sure you flip all the normals so that all the walls are pointing in instead of out. I used a texture set from Texture Haven for the floor. If you have the Node Wrangler add-on enabled, you can select the principal shader node and then press Ctrl, Shift and T and that'll import the whole texture set all at once already set up for you. The problem with floorboard textures is they tend to look really flat. Some of them come with displacement textures but you rarely get good results from that in my opinion. I prefer to use a little bit of real geometry. I just add a few loop cuts and then I align them to the gaps in the wood. Then I use Ctrl B to add a small bevel and I extrude those down slightly so we have a real gap in between each plank of wood. You can also do the same thing on the other gaps in the wood on the X axis and you'll get a realistic looking floor. It does take a little bit of work, but I think it's worth doing. The results pay off in the end. When it comes to making walls in Blender, it's tempting just to get a plane and stick a simple diffuse shader on it, but it is worth spending a little bit of extra time to get a more realistic result. Real painted walls have a sort of bump texture to them usually, and you can also see these smudges and spots where there's less or more variation in the roughness. To create that sort of variation, what I do is I connect the object output of a texture coordinate node to a noise texture. Then I crank the scale way up until I get some nice fine detail. I run that into a color ramp and then I plug that into the bump. That gives us all those little nice bumps on the texture of the paint. For the changes in the roughness, what I do is I create a second noise texture, but this time I use a really low scale, somewhere like 1 to 5. I plug that into the colour ramp and I play with the slider positions until I get these large patches of lighter colour. Then if we plug this into the roughness we can see that we get a nice bit of variation in the roughness of the paint. It looks like we kind of have all these sort of dirty smudges on the wall. The main light fitting on the ceiling was just a cylinder for the base and a half sphere for the dome. I turned the transmission value on the principal shader for the glass all the way up but I used a roughness value of about 0.3. That makes the glass look like it's frosted. Once we add a point light inside the dome, we get a realistic looking light fixture and it probably took about a minute. Okay, let's talk about rugs and carpets. I couldn't find an exact match for the rug texture, but I could find this one online, which is pretty close. Shops that sell rugs and carpets online are usually a great place to find these sorts of textures. I quickly just altered the colors in Photoshop to get a better match for the reference and then I used the Importers Planes add-on to add the texture as a mesh into Blender. I added a hair particle system to the plane and that'll automatically match the texture of the image that's applied to it, so all the hair particles will have the colour that's underneath. You just need to alter the size of the hair particles, including the thickness of the strands. Don't add more than a few thousand particles if it's just a rug, otherwise Blender's going to get really, really slow. Instead, what you want to do is go down to the child options and turn on interpolated. 
that's going to add a certain number of fake particles around every real particle without really slowing down your performance. I set the display and the render number here to 100 just so I could see what I was doing. Usually I have the display number lower. If you go into the clump settings you can change the way the particles are grouped together. You can also play with the kink and the roughness settings and you'll get all sorts of different styles and looks to the rug. I usually go into the shader manager too and I swap out the principal shader for a hair shader or a principal hair shader. Either of those look a little bit better. Modeling windows in Blender can be a real pain in the ass, but luckily there's a default add-on in Blender that can do it all for us called Archer Mesh. With Archer Mesh enabled, you just have to go to the Create Object menu and you'll have this option called Panel Window. This add-on has quite a lot of flexibility when it comes to defining the basic size and shape and materials of the windows, and of course you can go into Edit Mode and alter them once you've created it. Now the window's in place, we need some curtains. Blender Guru just did a really great 40 minute tutorial on making curtains, but I'm going to cover the whole thing in about 2 minutes. I've quickly modelled out a copy of the wall and the floor for this, just so you can more easily see what I'm doing. I've created a plane and scaled it to be about the size I want the curtain to be. In edit mode I've added a few loop cuts going in both directions. You don't need loads of loop cuts for this, that's just going to slow Blender down. I think I use less than 20 going in both directions. Select the top row of verts and create a new vertex group in the object data panel. Make sure you click assign to add the verts to the group. Now go back into object mode and add a cloth modifier. Under the subsection that's called shape, there's an option for pin. Add the vertex group you've just made as the pin object. Basically what that's going to do is when we run the simulation, anything that's pinned won't fall to the ground. And obviously we want the top of the curtain to stay at the top. If we play the simulation now, we can see that the cloth goes straight through the wall. We obviously don't want that to happen, so add a collision modifier to the walls and the floor, and give it a thickness value of 0.001. Once your basic cloth sim is working, add a subdivision surface modifier with two levels of subdiv. Make sure you move that above the cloth modifier in the modifier stack. You'll also want to right click on the curtain and shade it smooth. We're going to have to make the curtains bunch up here now, otherwise they won't look like curtains. Go back to the object data panel and add two new shape keys by pressing the plus icon twice. Go into edit mode and scale the curtain down on the X axis by pressing S and then X and scaling down. If you come out of edit mode now, you should be able to transition between those two shape keys by changing the value slider from 0 to 1. We can keyframe that value to make the change happen while the simulation is running. Set the value to 0 on about frame 25, then right click on the number and set the keyframe. Set another keyframe that's about 20 or 30 frames later with the value set to 1. Now if we run the simulation, it should automatically start bunching it up while it's running. If you try to apply the modifiers now, you will get this morning message saying you can't do that. All you have to do is just remove the shape keys first and then you can apply the whole modifier stack. You can repeat the same process again for the second curtain, but I'm lazy so what I usually do is I just duplicate the first one and then I mirror flip the whole thing by pressing Ctrl and M and then press X and that'll flip it on the X axis. So now that our curtains are done, we've got a little bit of privacy in the room. If you care about your privacy, you should check out the sponsor of this video, Surfshark. Surfshark's a VPN service that protects your privacy and unlocks parts of the internet that you can't otherwise access. If you've never heard of a VPN before, then you're missing out. It basically acts as an encrypted tunnel through the internet to protect your personal information from your ISP and nosy websites that want to track what you do online. The great thing about Surfshark is that you can use it to mask your location too, meaning that you can access services that aren't available in your country. I personally use Surfshark to access news websites that aren't available in Europe. I just switch my location over to America, refresh the page and I'm good to go. So here's what I'm going to do for you. If you follow the link in the description and enter the promo code DECODED at checkout, you'll get 83% off your subscription to Surfshark and you'll get 3 months for free. Even better, if you sign up before the end of Black Friday, you're going to get another month for free on top. Moving on, let's make some lamps. The lamps in this scene were all very simple. The main lamp in the corner was just made from a cylinder with the top and the bottom removed. 
I scaled out the bottom slightly and added a solidify modifier just to give it a little bit of thickness. To make the stand, I selected the lampshade and then I pressed Shift and S to put the 3D cursor right in the middle of the geometry. Then when I added a cylinder, the scene automatically went right in the middle of the lamp. I made one long leg and then I duplicated it twice, rotating each copy 120 degrees on the z-axis. You can see in the photo that the lampshade has this sort of grain texture to it and I wanted to replicate that. I just added a noise texture and I connected it to the object coordinates via a mapping node. Then if we scale the noise only on the z-axis, it's going to stretch that noise out and give us the nice grain effect. Then we can just feed that noise into a colour ramp and we can match the effect on the photo. To allow a little bit of light to pass through the lampshade, you're just going to want to bump up the transmission slider on the principal shader. The bedside lamps were made basically in the same way. I just copied the lampshade from the first lamp and I quickly altered the cylinder to match the shape of the stand. I used Ctrl and B to add a bevel just to give those nice curves around the side. The bed frame was just made with simple box modelling and a subdivision surface modifier. There's not much to talk about there, but you can save some time here by skipping on the UV unwrap. If you change the texture coordinates from UV to generated, you can switch the type of projection on the textures from flat to box. This basically projects the texture onto the mesh at 90 degree angles, making it perfect for objects that don't have a lot of curved surfaces. If you do have any visible seams, you can try just bumping up the blend value on each of the texture nodes from 0 to 1. One common problem that I see all the time on renders of bedrooms is that the bed sheets themselves look really crap. The reason is because most people just drop the cloth straight under the bed, something like this. You can get a much more natural placement on the sheets if you turn up the friction on the collision object and then you drop the sheet at a slight angle. That'll add all these nice creases and folds and it gives you a much more natural look. Then you can just slap a subdivision surface modifier on it, shade smooth the whole sheet and you'll get a really nice result. The bed sheets in the original image had a texture that I couldn't quite match so I just quickly made a bump map in Photoshop and I got some fairly similar results. Pillows and cushions are really simple to make in Blender these days thanks to the new pressure settings in the cloth simulator. Just make a cube and scale it down to be about a third of the height on the z-axis. Add about 20 loop cuts on the x and the y-axis and then add 3 cuts that go around the perimeter. Select that middle edge loop and use Ctrl B to bevel it into 3 separate edge loops. Select the middle one and just scale that in a little bit. What that's going to do is create a seam that goes around the side of the pillow. Give the box a subdivision surface modifier and a cloth modifier. In the cloth settings, make sure that you enable the pressure settings. You'll have to play with the value a little bit until you get something that looks right, so just run the simulation a few times and eventually you'll end up with a nice fluffy pillow. How about that? The chair in the corner was created with box modelling techniques again, just like the bed. The back cushion was made like the pillows on the bed, just using a cloth simulator and a collision modifier. To make the wrinkles on the upholstery, I used the voxel remesher which you can find in the object data panel. Once you've remeshed it, you've got some nice dense geometry there. You can go over to the sculpting panel and you can use the cloth brush just to add in all those nice wrinkles and details. I see a lot of people overdoing this stage. When it comes to wrinkles in cloth, especially on upholstery, less is usually more. Just a few wrinkles to sell it will be enough. So now we're in the final stretch here. We need to make some plants and decorations for the table and then we're basically done. I was planning to show you how to make real wicker baskets, but honestly, it's not really worth it for such a small detail in the scene. I just used a photo texture on some really simple geometry with a displacement map instead. For the plant pot, that was really simple too. I used a noise texture node again, just to add some random smudges and variation to the roughness of the material, like we did for the paint on the walls. To make a plant for the pot, I found this good leaf texture set and I added it to a plane. I cut the plane up using a few loop cuts and then I separated each leaf into its own object. Make sure the origin of every one of these leaves is at the bottom of the stem. So select all the leaves and use Ctrl G to add them into their own group, just call it leaves or something like that. Now add a plane to the scene and in edit mode delete three of the four verts. 
With the remaining vert, move that to the middle of the pot and then extrude it out so it's roughly in the shape of a plant. You can just hold down control and right click on the scene in side view and you'll automatically extrude out the edges wherever you click. If you turn on proportional editing and you change the proportional mode to connected only, you can grab the ends of the stem and then you can pull them out so your plant isn't completely flat. Add a skin modifier to the plant and you'll get this horrendous mess at first. What you want to do is go into edit mode, switch over to wireframe view so you can see what you're doing. Select all of the verts and now you can scale the skin modifier down just by pressing Ctrl and A. Don't ask us why it isn't just S to scale like it is for everything else but it's Ctrl and A. Give it a subdivision surface modifier and then apply all the modifiers in the stack. Give the mesh a hair particle system and under the render settings change the type to collection and select that leaf group that we just made earlier. Near the top of the settings for the hair particle system we have this option to change the source type. Change that so all the particles are emitted from each vert and then alter the scale and the scale random values so all the leaves have a little bit of a different size. If you enable the advanced checkbox you can also enable rotation and you can play with the random rotation on the leaves. I like to play with the rotation on the Z axis. Finally, mix the leaf material with the translucent shader, then give the stem of the plant a green material as well. If you've done all that right you should have a pretty convincing looking house plant and it takes 4 or 5 minutes. Ok so before we render this out let's just talk about lighting, because lighting is something that will make or break just about any render. I chose to basically match the lighting that was in the original photo for the scene. For the environment outside I just cut out the window view from the original photograph, I stuck it on a plane with an emission shader and that looked good enough. I unchecked the shadow option in the object panel though which means that light will be able to pass straight through the plane and it won't block any light from coming through the window. The first light in the scene is actually just a simple emission plane which is just behind the camera. You can see that being reflected on the left hand side of the picture on the photo frame. Then we have three lamps and the main house light that's on the ceiling. There's a slightly orange fill light that are placed just underneath the main light which gives the whole room a little bit of a warmer look. Then there's a big emission plane outside that gives some natural light into the room It basically acts as the sun. Finally, there's a tiny little light on the floor just to the right of the camera, it adds a little highlight onto the wood. Interior scenes do tend to be really noisy because of all the bounce lighting, there's nothing you can really do about that unfortunately. I just disabled Corsix, I clamped the indirect lighting and I used a big sample number, I think 4000 samples. People always go nuts if I don't include a comparison shot at the end of these videos, so here's the original photo. And here's my final render after a little bit of colour grading in Photoshop. I was really happy with the final render here but unfortunately I did have to use a little bit of denoising which I didn't want to do because I did take out some of the details on the walls and things. But that in a nutshell is how to put together a realistic interior scene in Blender. Hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already and I'll catch you in a few days with another video.